You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisentraff on WCPT 820. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer is fast becoming one of the best known political leaders in America. Now in her second term, she's led the state through the pandemic and to a hugely successful recovery. She's attracted billions in private investment that will secure the economy of the state for another generation. She's rebuilt crumbling infrastructure. She's even often um, uh, united uh, the state's Republicans and Democrats to get things done. All of this is a model for political leaders across the country. But in one particular area, Governor Whitmer has been more than a leader, more than a fighter. On the topic of women, their health, their economic opportunities, the reality of their daily challenges, Governor Whitmer has done what the greatest teachers do. She's made a C with courage and an abundance of humanity. She, she's taught men and even some women to see beyond society's most enduring prejudices. So I am thrilled that she's joining us today to talk about the craziness that's found its way to our Supreme Court just this week. Governor, welcome. I'm so glad to be with you. Thank you. So the, the, the Supreme Court this week uh, is hearing this case on banning uh, the abortion pill, mefepristone, and should never have gotten to them. But to talk about that. Yeah, you know, in, in Michigan, I'm really proud that we were able to, in the wake of the Dobbs decision, keep abortion legal here in Michigan, despite the fact that we had a 1931 zombie law on the books that would have made Michigan one of the most extreme states in the country without any exceptions for rape or incest even. I filed a lawsuit early on, and um, I mean, thousands of volunteers got out and collected signatures, and we went to the ballot. And we never lost that right in Michigan, and the people overwhelmingly had an opportunity to weigh in, and we enshrined abortion rights into our Constitution. One of the things that I've been working so hard to educate people in my own state about is, despite all those efforts to expand access to health care for women, we now are, once again, at risk of losing um, access because this SCOTUS um, hearing about Miffy Pristone if they support, you know, if they uphold the ruling of the lower court, Miffy Person won't be available. And that is about 60% of the abortions in this country are, are medical, med, you know, medicine abortions using Miffy Person. And so even in a state like Michigan, it will hamper our ability to exercise our rights under the Michigan Constitution now. So we're all very much at risk once again. Yeah. And this is a case that is only of only finding its way to the courts because of Dobbs. Um, you know, I, I don't know. You're so smart. What should we do about this? How do we how do we organize to fight it? It isn't really just through the courts anymore. Well, that's right. And I think that's part of why, as we think about this upcoming presidential election, abortion is on this ballot. Uh, I did an interview not long ago, and they said, well, abortion's on the ballot in six states. I said, oh, no, it's on the ballot in all 50 states, because if there is a second Donald Trump term, he has already vowed to sign an abortion ban in this country. So even in states like Illinois or California, New York, Michigan now, we all could lose access. And that's why this presidential election is so incredibly important that we reelect President Biden and Vice President Harris and that we send more pro-freedom, pro-reproductive uh, freedom advocates to Congress in the, in the U.S. House and in the U.S. Senate. In Michigan, you've been able to do more than just overturn this 19, was it 31? ridiculous, ancient, um, cruel law. You, you also, I think, have tightened up the licensing and uh, restrictions so that the kind of Larry Nasser terrible abuse can't, can, nobody can turn a blind eye to that anymore. These issues are all related in that um, for whatever reason, people like Donald Trump and the folks who are pushing this stuff, they just don't see women as as um, fully yet members of our society, which seems 
unbelievably crazy. It is. It's it's hard to get your head around sometimes when when you really step back and think about. We still accept that in the United States, women are paid, you know, seventy nine cents on the dollar that men are in the same position with the same educational background and work ethic. Um, when we think about tests that have been done around pharmaceuticals, they traditionally have been done only around men, and we're just starting to really appreciate how a woman having a heart attack presents, right? So it has, it's this long standing, I think, belief that um, women are not equivalent or equitable to men. And we see this in the policies of the Trump administration. We see this in the attacks on women's rights. We see this in terms of just even attacks on things like IVF and um, surrogacy. We know that these are, are all policies that stem out of that same fundamental um, value system that that you pointed out that women aren't full citizens. We don't get the same level of uh, protection and respect under the law. And that abortion was one of those things that propelled women into the workforce that gave us agency over our own lives, being able to um, access health care when we need it and make our decisions about when we are prepared to bring a child into the room or into the world. And so I think that this is um, an extension of, of old, outdated uh, belief systems that, that continue to be practiced by some people and just continue to stay on the books with regard to a lot of, lot of laws. Governor, this suit was so um, uh, poorly conceived that even this Supreme Court is going to have a tough time banning mefepristone. But I, 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 I want your um, counsel, if they, if they go ahead and say, you know what, no, we're not banning mefepristone, we can't say no to the FDA's ability to do its job right now. I don't think that means we're off the hook. And, I, and I'm wondering how we explain to people that um, these guys are going to keep coming back and they're going to keep trying. I think one of the things that was very telling, and I didn't listen to all of the oral argument, but um, I have seen some of the analysis. And I, one of the things that's telling is that perhaps um, they will uh, overturn the lower court based on a lack of standing. Lack of standing means there's no one there that appropriately could bring that lawsuit. It doesn't at all go to the merits of the lawsuit, which means if someone with standing brought it, maybe the court would entertain it. They've left that door open. They also had some discussion about the Comstock law or act. And um, this is perhaps sending a signal that if someone else wants a challenge on another legal theory, perhaps they would be open to entertaining it. And so I think that with the makeup of this court and the rationale that they cited in Dobbs, I don't think anyone can feel safe even if they overrule the lower court on this case, because I think that we will see continued onslaught of lawsuits to um, undermine a woman's ability to to exercise her reproductive freedom in this country. Yeah. Well, you've been generous with your time, and I know I promised I would keep this to about <laughs> about a little less time than we've already spent. So I, I'm very grateful to you for coming on and and sharing your thoughts uh, on this really important topic. Well, thank you for delving into it and, and talking about it, because I, I do think it's so important that people have the opportunity to really understand what is at stake here. And, you know, a victory on this case, I, I'm, I'm hoping for that, but it doesn't mean that this, that this fight is over. We've got a lot lot more ahead of us than this upcoming election is going to be pivotal. So I thank you for giving me some time on your show tonight.